The CBS All Access series The Stand wrapped up its nine-episode season in two episodes, a showstopper appropriately titled The Stand and a quieter epilogue made up of largely new material titled The Circle Closes. Here are some of the most confusing aspects of the ending of The Stand explained. Once Glenn, Ray, and Larry finally make it to Randall Flagg's evil empire in Las Vegas to make their final stand, they are immediately arrested and put on trial. Glenn tragically never survives a courtroom, and Ray and Larry are subsequently sentenced to death via drowning. The pair are chained to the bottom of an empty pool as it slowly fills with water in front of a crowd of spectators. But before Larry and Ray can meet their watery end, thick clouds gather over the building's central atrium and start zapping people with lightning bolts. Soon, the lightning coalesces into a floating ball. It finishes by repeatedly zapping Flag himself, then destroying everything, including Larry and Ray, by detonating a nuclear warhead. Safe to say, that was no ordinary lightning. In the book, although the circumstances are a bit different, the warhead is detonated by a hand of God, described as a giant glowing hand in the sky. If you look closely as the clouds wrap around Flag's building, they do resemble fingers meaning that the lightning was basically divine intervention. Given the strong spiritual themes in the series, it's fitting that an act of God would be the thing that would finally take out Flag, at least for the time being. Although four set out from Boulder to Las Vegas, only three arrive safely. Stu Redman breaks his leg en route and is left behind with Glenn's dog Kojak, some travel supplies, and enough pain meds to either take the edge off for a few days or provide Stu with a swift and painless exit. However, it never comes to that. It turns out that Dana Jurgen's desperate warning notes to Tom Cullen was successful, despite his illiteracy. After hiding from Flag's henchmen under a pile of dead bodies, Tom was able to escape Las Vegas and started the long walk toward Boulder. On his way back, Tom's attention is drawn by Kojak, whom he joyfully follows. While we never see Tom's reunion with Stu, we can infer it happens when Stu finally makes it back to Boulder. Tom saved my life, Franny. By the time they make it back, Stu is walking, and it's clear from Franny's narration that a fair amount of time has passed. In the book, this time gap is explained by Tom nursing Stu back to health in a hunting lodge, aided by the ghost of Nick Andros. In the show, we'll just have to use our imaginations. One of the creepiest subplots in The Stand is Nadine's supernatural pregnancy, fathered by Randall Flagg. Nadine encountered Flagg in a vision while she was crossing the desert to get to Las Vegas, and they finally consummated their disturbing relationship with him transforming into a horrific demon mid-act. After arriving in Vegas, it didn't take very long for Nadine to realize she was pregnant with Flagg's offspring. Who or what was gestating inside Nadine's womb will always be left to viewers' imaginations, but we can at least venture to say that it wasn't a healthy baby human. For one thing, Nadine went from being a virgin to seemingly nine months pregnant in the span of just a few days. For another, it was clear from Nadine's corpse-like appearance and the sharp movements beneath her skin that whatever was inside her was consuming her from the inside out. Nadine finally realized that she was never intended to survive the birth, and throws herself from Flag's penthouse window. From Flag's devastated reaction, we can assume that whatever Nadine was about to give birth to was instrumental to his plan, and was most likely intended to be the demonic successor to Flag himself. Fortunately for everyone, that plan never came to fruition. Although the stand is filled with human characters, it is ultimately about a war between cosmic forces of good and evil. On the side of good, representing the will of God, is Mother Abigail. And on the side of evil, there is Randall Flagg. But unlike Mother Abigail, who is uniquely gifted but undeniably human, Flagg is something else. Not only can he fly, but he can also apparently regenerate after being repeatedly struck by lightning and then vaporized by a nuclear blast. To call Flag the devil is probably both the right answer and an oversimplification. Mother Abigail alludes to the idea that he is actually the son of the devil. He simply showed you what he thought would scare you into doing his will. He's his father's son, and he tempted you. However, in Stephen King's books, Flag is more of an ageless, malevolent wizard who repeatedly shows up to push characters toward darkness. So in the broader scope of King's works, Flag is both a sort of living devil and also something else a little more human. In The Stand, however, the character leans more heavily into the devil persona both in how some of his actions mirror biblical stories and in his demands to be worshipped. The Trash Can Man is one of the more enigmatic characters in The Stand. 
characterized only by his pyromania and an erratic behavior that indicates some sort of neurodivergence. He's introduced well into the series, and is tasked with retrieving a nuclear warhead that Flag intends to drop on the Boulder Free Zone. But instead, the trash can man covered in radiation burns drives the warhead into Flag's hotel where it is then detonated by the hand of God. In the miniseries, there's no explanation given for the trash can man's odd behavior. He seems to think he's doing Flag a favor, but we never get any context as to why. In the book, though, it's a little more fleshed out. The trash can man brings Flag the bomb to make up for accidentally wiping out a big chunk of his Air Force. That scene never happens in the miniseries, so the trash can man's motivations are much more vague. Taking him at his word, he simply misunderstands what Flag wants him to do with the warhead and thinks it makes sense to bring it straight to his leader. Whoops. After Stu and Franny decide to depart Boulder for Maine, they pause in Nebraska to rest and restock, taking up residence in an abandoned farmhouse. Only, the cornfield outside the house isn't as abandoned as they think. A young woman is staying in a tent in the field. At first, the girl's presence seems ominous, but later, once she helps Stu save Franny and then miraculously heals Franny's wounds, it's clear she's on the side of good. The implication is that she's a reincarnated version of Mother Abigail, or at least someone like her, chosen by God to possess special gifts. Her presence is never really explained, and she vanishes when Stu and Franny are safe again. Considering that Flag is shown to still be alive at the end of the series, introducing the girl shows that there is also still someone like Mother Abigail in the world to help balance him out. As Mother Abigail tells Franny, The wheel keeps turning. The struggle continues. But the command is always the same. History will continue to repeat, and evil will never be fully defeated. But Mother Abigail's point is that resistance should never end either. The girl seems to show that as long as there is evil, there will also be powerful good. After tumbling into a well, Franny dreams of encountering Flag in a forest. There, he names her biggest fears, that she will die of her injuries, leaving her baby to die of exposure, and that Stu will die in an accident before he can get back to them. But he offers her a way to prevent that outcome if she'll give him just one thing. I would like a kiss. He explains that the kiss will give him the ability to see through her eyes every now and then. For a second, it looks like Franny may give in, but then she makes her choice clear. Not for my husband, not for my baby, not for the world itself! Get thee behind me, you f***ing bastard! While the transition obviously takes a bit of liberty, Franny is actually quoting the Bible and the book of Matthew when the devil tempts Jesus in the desert. Just like the devil in the story, Flag offers Franny everything her heart desires, and just like Jesus, Franny refuses to be tempted. In doing so, Franny finally gets to make her own stand against evil. Similarly to how Franny's last confrontation with Flag is heavy with biblical references, so is her final conversation with Mother Abigail. After praising Franny for resisting the temptation of evil, Mother Abigail tells her that she will have five children, 20 grandchildren, and 70 great-grandchildren. Your children will replenish the earth. This also mirrors a story in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, God rewards Abram's faithfulness by telling him that his family will become a great nation and that they shall become the recipients of the promised land. The parallel is clear. By rejecting Flag, Franny has been blessed by God for great things. She knows that taking a stand against evil isn't a one-time action, but that even in the face of hardship, her instruction is clear. Be true. Stand. After the dust of Las Vegas has settled at the end of the stand, it's easy to wonder, what was the point? Why did Mother Abigail bother sending the four representatives there, if the city was going to be blown up in a nuclear blast anyway? Even the hearts Larry and Ray were changing right at the end didn't ultimately seem to matter, since those people died along with the rest of the inhabitants of Las Vegas. Obviously, it's hard to say what would have happened if the quartet had never set out for Vegas. But it's possible that the only reason the Hand of God appeared over Flag's casino was because of the demonstration of faith from Larry, Ray, and Glenn. By refusing to bow to Flag, they demonstrated conviction and faith to the people of Las Vegas. That faith then spread to others who would have otherwise been complacent. Many of the stand's themes are about the power of resisting evil, even if the personal cost is high. So even though Larry, Ray, and Glenn died, their commitment to righteousness was likely the thing that saved their friends. The final moments of the stand are a bit disturbing, as Flag stumbles into a village isolated from both the modern world and the deadly superflu. After killing a member of the tribe, Flag levitates and introduces himself. My name is Russell Faraday. Whoa! 
worship me! It's clear that the cycle is beginning yet again. Flag will continue to corrupt and gain power wherever he can, and it will be up to the good people of the world to resist his influence. The new name he gives himself is especially interesting. A Faraday cage is an enclosure used to block electromagnetic fields, which seems significant considering Flag was defeated by a ball of divine lightning. Calling himself Faraday feels almost like a challenge to God, insisting that the next time God comes after him, he'll be ready. After Franny, Stu, and baby Abigail leave, we never learn what happens to the rest of the growing population of Boulder. However, before Franny and Stu leave, they talk about how it seems as though it's only a matter of time before all of the familiar vices and failings of human society creep inside the town's peaceful borders. This echoes what Franny says earlier, in her musing that she's not sure humanity is capable of picking a better path than before even with a complete reset. And it's repeated again toward the end of the episode, when Mother Abigail talks about the repetitive nature of human history. So what does that mean for Boulder? It means that they'll get back to normal, with all that normal entails. It means the residents will find happiness and friendship and love, but that there will also be pain and bitterness and violence. It means that they won't get a happy ending, but they also won't get a sad one. Because, as Franny says, Truth is, most stories don't end at all. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.